I'm conscious our audience has, has, has asked questions. I'm going to, I'm going to ask, uh, you know, as, as they continue to stream in, uh, we'll try to answer as, as many as we can. Um, there was one particular question uh, I think that was that was addressed to you, Amy, and that's and I'm going back to the leadership conversation or the leadership element of it, and that's around structural safety. Uh, can you give us an example of structural safety? Um, yeah, I'll give you two but very quickly. Um, one is, you know, suppose that you are a leader of an organization and you have had the great strength of mind to require and begin to. Uh, institutionalize strategic foresight, futures work in some fashion into your strategy. Could you ask of business unit leaders that their units be responsible every year for one set of probable projections and one set of scenarios that are improbable, but would be produ produce great opportunities? Can you incent or incentivize imagination and what is not expected. So that's one. Um, the other is you can, of course, commit resources to go to your budget. Should you have um, a contest that invites people to produce ideas in which that they think would help the, the organization uh, either find a new market or do something internally better, commit to um, putting some money and putting resources behind a few of those ideas and make sure that those ideas are not only from the small circle of executives, but from um, what are rudely called rank and file. So those are ways of creating structures um, that help drive you know, imagination and, and, and produce a sense of safety and recognition, as you pointed out. Fantastic. Does that answer the question, I hope. Um, there is a, a related question to this that has come through that I, that I wanted to, to pose, and I'm going to open it up both to you and to Shmia, and that's around um, the, the, the flexibility or otherwise of, of role players in, in the mining sector. And the question, I'll just read it as, as is, um, you know, it's particularly harder in, in, in the mining sector to make swift strategy implementation with a highly unionized workforce. Um, implementation it tends to be much uh, to take much longer and trade unions see themselves as outsiders more than than partners yeah. interesting take um, any thoughts around um, how role players that may not see themselves as partners at the moment could be brought in and could become participating contributing members to this mm. whether in the market or otherwise please go ahead yeah Shmira. Yeah. So this question came through from Dr. Moswadire, who's in the mining um, uh, mining sector, and it came through as we were talking about this idea of platforms and um, uh, uh, collaborative platforms that are agnostic and neutral. And it was such an interesting question because, you know, in the negotiations between uh, mines and and unions, for example, each player has to have their antagonistic uh, um, view that is very bedded in a history and a narrative of who they are and identity. And it becomes really difficult to negotiate a new position when you've got your, yourself dug in to your current positions. And I think this is where this idea of communities of practice can allow you to let go of that identity that uh, you know your organization has crafted for itself and allow yourself to Amy's point around license to imagine. If we could give them a space where they don't have to have that mantle, that identity, and they can imagine themselves playing a different role. Um, I think that this could be such a powerful way to move some of these very stuck relationships that we see. And, and maybe a follow-up of this uh, panel is to try to create that um, uh, in the sector with this particular um, participant. I think that could be a really valuable outcome of this discussion. That, that's fantastic. And maybe just to, just to, just to add to it, uh, as, as you were speaking, um, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, and, and both you and Amy have alluded to it, um, the role of imagination here. The role of we see certain role players as they are. We don't always see them as what they could be. And I'll just share a very quick story. 
it kind of, I think, will, might, might resonate with the audience and it really builds on exactly what you've said. It didn't involve specifically unions. It involved a, a different stakeholder group that can be a, even more difficult, which are regulators. Uh, so a number of years ago, we were asked by a telecommunications group um, who wanted to uh, essentially include um, banking products in their mix. And this is the days before mobile money became sexy and, and, and kind of an accepted in many countries. Um, they wanted to know how do we incorporate this? And we got into a, a long discussion at the end of which we realized that the people who were in the room, not even the regulators yet. And in fact, in that case, there were two regulators, the financial services regulator and there is a telecoms regulator. In fact, it was the people in the room who could not imagine a future within you could walk into a telecommunications shop and open a check account or ask for a loan or get a personalized credit card. Um, and, and the view in the room was that, you know, we, we cannot go to the regulator and even ask that. Our response to it was to ask which regulator exactly are they referring to? Because there seemed to be a lot of fear and anxiety in the room of what might happen if even the question gets asked, if this imagined future um, and as we started to work through an alternative future of what this could look like, um, we actually figured out that there is a conversation that could be had that will be beneficial to that particular stakeholder, being the regulator. Uh, cut a long story short, uh, in a process that lasted probably a, a better part of a year, uh, they became the first telecom operator in Africa uh, to be able to do that. And now in their home country, which I, I will not mention, um, <laughs> You can literally, probably the most advanced in Africa, in my view, a, a country in which you can um, buy you know, a full suite of financial services through a, a whole set of, of partners being in telecommunications or in some cases even in the informal economy to an extent. So I guess I'm alluding more to the role of, of our ability to imagine role players different a different role playing a different role to where they are today but really thank you for the question and and for the different builds that, that were brought in during the discussion i am conscious of my time so perhaps one one last uh, question and i'm going to go back to to shmir to, to, to an area you're very passionate about and that's about the youth how do we encourage and empower the youth who do not see a way out of this current economic downturn that's a very mm. that, that's, that's get very personal doesn't it um, mm. Yeah, you know we've we've got uh, youth are in very different circumstances in the country. We've got youth who are graduates. Um, that that's an elite. But if the economy picks up, generally grads will be pulled back into jobs. Grad grad unemployment isn't isn't our biggest problem, and it's very linked to economic growth. But we we have got youth out there who. Uh, have just finished school, who have a, a, a secondary certificate, um, or we've got a whole lot of youth that haven't even finished secondary school. And I don't have an answer. I, I am um, plagued by this question of, of how we shift the mindset of young people who, quite honestly, we have left behind. We have left a generation of people behind. I think there are some clues to what we can do in 4IR, uh, every yes youth that gets placed in a job gets a smartphone with their placement and the smartphone has got zero rated apps, which means that young people don't pay for the data on anything they, they use on those apps. So we've got training material, we've got beautiful movies and stories of, uh, of young people who've navigated through difficulties and come out on the other side. And I think that's probably our best clue or idea on how we shift mindset is by sharing with young people, other young people, and how by shifting their mindset, using imagination, that's a theme today, um, you know, you can almost manifest a different future, that, that our, our own views and mindsets can be a prison or they can be the portal. Um, and, and so we're trying to, to, to really use growth mindset themes we send nudges and inspiring messages to young people, um, but we still get, there's the odd, you know, most young people really respond to this. And there's some people who are still quite stuck. Um, but this is, this is a bigger, bigger national question. It's a question for business South Africa. And it's one of those, those big platforms that need to be created on how we all work together 
um, to shift this mindset of young people. But we also have to open our arms and we have to welcome them in and we have to meet them halfway. And we can't do that in small pockets. This has to be uh, a business coalition and fellowship um, to be able to get these big questions right. And, and it is a lovely question, actually, as we come to the end of this, um, because it speaks to the types of problems that plague us as a society that we will only be able to solve as a fellowship. Thank you. I, I really appreciate this. I know this question uh, touches the, the, the lives and the hearts of many people, not just here in South Africa, but, in, but globally.